Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be back here at uh, Wheaton Chapel. It occurred to me as I walked in this morning that I haven't been here for 36 years. That's pretty bad chapel attendance, I know. <laughs> I didn't come to uh, talk about Compassion International today. I'm honored to come and be a part of this series on, on healing. I know something about pain and something about suffering and something about abuse and the need for healing. So I came just as part of the Wheaton family, just as Wes today. In the book I wrote, Just a Minute, I make the case that the spirit of children are very tender and uh, impressionable. Uh, like wet cement, it doesn't take any effort at all to make an imprint in the life of a little child. And so those imprints, when the cement dries as they grow, can, uh, can uh, can last a lifetime. You can launch the life of a child in one moment of kindness, and you can destroy the life of a child with one moment of abuse and hurt. And I suspect if we went around the room, uh, you uh, could tell me people who either blessed you as a little child or hurt you, and you have spent the rest of your life fighting over uh, the pain that happened to you. Um, Graham Greene said, there is always one moment in childhood when the door opens and lets the future in. This morning, I want to tell you about one minute in my childhood uh, when I was nine years old and the impact that it has had on the rest of, of my life. But first, let's, let's pray. Lord, I know that you know every heart in this room and every story in this room. You know our moments and our days. I know that you don't need me this morning or anything that I'm about to say to do what you want to do uh, in our lives. So as we gather together like this, Lord, uh, may the words of my mouth and may the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So I am a, a living testament that God can redeem anything. If God can use me, he can use absolutely anyone. I am proof that the pain and sorrow and the loss of our lives can actually be leveraged for good in the hands of our Heavenly Father. My passion to rescue children from poverty and abuse had its origins in my own traumatic childhood. My story is one of great sorrow that engulfed me when the foundation of my life was actually being laid, when the cement of my soul was soft and impressionable. The story was so painfully confusing to me that I didn't speak of it for 35 years. It shaped my life and through it, God ultimately uh, brought my heart into ministry. But I didn't share my story. And the reason I didn't was my love for my Lord. It seemed if I was going to tell the story of my life, I would have to somehow apologize on God's behalf for allowing this to happen to me, a vulnerable little boy. I would wonder, where did my prayers go? Where did my screams and my cries for mercy into my pillow go? Was I assigned the laziest guardian angel in all of heaven? The story finally got told because I wrote a book. I wrote a book called Too Small to Ignore. And in the process of writing it, I thought this is the manifesto. This is it strategically and statistically and scripturally about the importance of children. And I would fight on behalf of children to the, the, the rest of the church. But my publishers, when I turned in my manuscript, said, that's great, Wes, but they're not going to care what you know until they know why you care. Are you willing to just write a book, or are you willing to do battle on behalf of children? And in that moment, I realized that I had come to a crossroads where I had to, painful though it may be, I had to allow God to redeem all of my story, even the painful parts that I'm going to share with you today. There were some days when I was writing that book that I wrote one sentence, I leaned back in my chair, and I wept the rest of the day away. In finally telling my whole story, however, I discovered a beautiful picture, ultimately, of God's grace. I discovered that I had been looking at the wrong side of the tapestry. I had seen the ugly knots and the tangles, but suddenly I could see uh, beauty in the midst of the path I had been down. I could see his deliberate orchestration of a life that had been lovingly entrusted to me, even though I had pain. 
He crafted me a tool for his use, redeemed for his glory. And let me explain how that came about. I believe that I received my calling. I believe I received my purpose and my mission. And I did my first and most courageous act all at the same time. In my darkest, most painful moment, in about 60 seconds, at the age of 10. For me, the moment involved a candle. It involved a pink birthday candle. That sounds awfully nice, but this candle had been trimmed with a pocket knife so that the blunt end now also had a wick. And it had been set on fire and had been put into my hands, my trembling little nine-year-old fingers, by the man who was an authority over me, the house parent at the boarding school for missionary children where I had grown up in Africa. This school had been my home for nine months out of every year since I was six years old. I'm going to tell you the story of that candle, but I think it's important that you understand that this was a watershed moment in my life. My life can be divided before candle and after damage. I remember the house parent marched me into the school dining room. There were 50 little children there. He dragged up a metal chair up on the cement floor and he pushed me up onto that chair. He crammed that candle into my hands and he said, children, you cannot serve both God and Satan. Wes has tried. You cannot burn a candle at both ends without getting burned. Watch what happens when you try. 50 terrified little missionary children watched in total silence. Nobody dared even breathe. Striking a match, this man lit the wick, both wicks on the candle. Watch, he said. And standing on that chair with my knees knocking in fear, I stared incredulously at this candle in my shaking fingers as I contemplated what this was going to mean very, very soon. You see, it was mission policy back in those days that all of the missionary children across West Africa left their mothers and fathers at age six, traveled 700 miles, a full day's trip by truck into this isolated little jungle village. My little friends, 50 of them, like me, had experienced unspeakable cruelty and abuse in this place. The, pap the people in charge of us were missionaries, but they didn't go to Africa to take care of children. They went to Africa to save souls, and something went wrong. They didn't make it linguistically, or they didn't make it cross-culturally. And so they were simply given the assignment, the least desirable assignment you could possibly have on the mission field, and that was, well, then go take care of other missionaries' children. They weren't called to work with children. They weren't trained to work with children. They didn't want to work with children. Nobody watched them work with children or supervised. And so they took out their resentful spirit, their anger, their un they were completely unsupervised. They took their frustration and rage out on the most convenient targets, which was a bunch of us little children in their charge. I learned very early on, and it's why I fight so hard for children today, I learned that terrible things can happen when children are considered unimportant, a second-rate mandate, the lowest of the priorities. The stage for this horrendous moment had been set four long years before. All through my young life at this school, I had endured daily beatings. Belt buckles and truck tire ted tread sandals had bruised and torn my flesh since I was six years old. There was a million ways to get a, a beating in that place. It was a cacophony of frightened little children pleading for mercy, the crack of the belt. Just having a wrinkle in your bedspread at age six was enough for a beating, or to be caught during nap time with your eyes open was enough. I remember when I was nine years old and they taught us in math class how to average. The most frequently reoccurring thing in my life that had occurred to me, maybe I should average, was how many times do they beat me in this place? And so I did some pretty sad research. For several weeks, I simply kept tally on a little piece of paper hidden underneath my pillow. How many times do they beat me in that place? And then finally I did the math and I discovered that I was being beaten by these people 17 times per week. Not just 17, not 17 wax, but 17 occasions to be beaten, sometimes as long as it took for them to break my spirit. So I knew pain, but this, this candle, well, this was, this was something new. 
The staff at this boarding school had abused us children in every way that children can be abused, not only physically, as I just described, but emotionally. If you had known me as a little six-year-old boy, I didn't make eye contact with grown-ups. Grown-ups were dangerous people. Nothing good could come from an encounter with a grown-up. So I walked around with my head down, trying not to, uh, trying to be invisible, trying not to be seen. Destroyed emotionally, destroyed spiritually. They were very strict on the spiritual side of things. And us little children, we were terrified of their powerful and vengeful God. And we were painfully aware daily that we were little sinners in the hands of their angry God. I won't dwell on the sexual abuse that we endured, but anywhere that evil reigns unchecked, this favorite weapon of Satan is always there. It always lurks. Tragically for us little kids, the very people who were reading us our Bible stories, a couple hours later when the generator were off, were on the prowl down the hallways, preying on defenseless little children far, far, far from home. Older boys who were victims themselves learned how to mimic their elders in an environment of depravity. They, they served their own lustful desires and abused little children. They kept us quiet with blackmail and the threat of physical pain. There was no one to protect us. We had no advocates, no arms to run into for protection. The very people who should have been our trusted defenders were in fact our attackers. And so now, standing on that chair with that candle gripped between my fingers, I was at my lowest, darkest moment. I cannot describe to you the culmination of hurt and rage and hopelessness and despair that welled up in my little, at this point, 10-year-old soul. At this man's hands, I had always lost. I had always been manipulated, hurt, plain and simple. He was bigger and stronger. He was a man. I was a boy. And so I resigned myself to this new level of humiliation. Why not yet again? This wasn't just some sexual deviation from some wayward priest on a campout retreat. This was every day for years on 50 of us little children. I do not believe that hell burns hot enough. So here we were. He spoke angrily to the assembled children. He said, this little boy standing here is Satan's favorite tool. He told, he told, and the devil used him to destroy his parents' important ministry in Africa. Look at him. There will be Africans in hell because of this little boy, Wesley. At those words, suddenly there arose in me a rage, a passion that I have never experienced before and I have never experienced since. I had felt that I can endure almost anything from this man's hands, and I had for years. But this time with a candle, it was different. Never had words cut so deeply into my spirit. So yes, I had told. That was the greatest of crimes. As a desperate little boy, I had cried out to my mother for help. For years, 50 of us little children had courageously maintained our silence. If you tell what happens here, they told us, you will destroy your parents' ministry in Africa. Our abusers used our love for God, our love for our parents, and our love for Africans to secure our silence about the horrors of that place. In study after study, psychologists, child psychologists, have been stunned to discover how much pain and abuse a child is willing to endure to protect the people that they love. We were no exception. We wrote letters every Sunday, but we couldn't even hint at our sadness, our loneliness, or the abuse. All the letters were censored, and the slightest attempt to cry out to our parents resulted in a beating and a forced rewriting of the letter. We learned to be silent like lambs. We had no idea that our silence was enabling the perpetuation of this evil against us. And even during the three months that we were able to be home with our mothers and fathers, we all, all 50 of us, kept our silence. We loved our parents too much. We saw how passionately they were spreading the gospel. I loved my African friends in my village. And I remember thinking as a little boy, if my silence about what these people do to me will win my friend's salvation, then bring it on. I'll endure anything. At school, we weren't allowed to have pictures of our parents. Some child development genius thought that would be too hard on us, I guess. 
We weren't allowed to get caught crying in our homesickness. So every year, as I said goodbye to my parents, my mind snapped a picture of them in that final pose. And every night, as I went to bed from age six, seven, and eight, Whenever I closed my eyes, all I could see was my precious mother and father so far away. And I risked a great deal by crying silently into, into my pillow. But by the ninth month of the, of the school year, I couldn't remember what my parents looked like anymore. And my greatest fear was when, I, when they come to get me or when they pe- take me to them, I won't know who my parents are and it will break their hearts. So I tried so hard to memorize and remember what they looked like. My big crime that led to the candle happened when I was nine years old after a year in the United States on furlough. I found myself along with other missionary children at the New York uh, uh, LaGuardia Airport. Us little MKs were saying goodbye to our parents. We were going by airplane, propeller airplane in those days, Uh, but the parents were coming by ship with supplies. We were about to board that plane. When at the gate, I took my mother's face in my hand. She knelt down to my size, and I looked at her, this beautiful, kind face, and I just looked a little too long. I was trying so hard to memorize what she looked like, but it was too long. And she said, Wesley, what are you doing? And I said, oh, Mommy, I just don't want to forget what you look like. It broke her heart, as you can imagine. She dissolved into tears, and so did I. And I saw a moment, I saw an opportunity, maybe an SOS, and I blurted out in 30 seconds all that I could possibly say that fast. I said, Mommy, please don't send me back there. Please don't send me back there. They hate me. They beat me. I can't tell you what they do to me. Please, Mommy, please, please, please. I'll never forget the look of horror on her face. She had no idea that this had been going on. Remember, she said, what? She held me tightly. I heard her murmur, what can I do? What can I do? And I felt her sobbing in my embrace. But not a minute later, my sister and I were both whisked onto the airplane. My friends who had overheard this looked at me like dead man walking. Nobody wanted to talk to me. Nobody sat with me all the way. They didn't want any part of what would be the punishment they knew would eventually come my way. I had broken the code of silence. I had told. On the ship during the month-long voyage back, my mother, with no more information than what I had blurted out, brokenhearted and confused, sure enough experienced a major psychological, emotional breakdown. And when she got to Africa, they sent her right straight back to America. Word of her illness and what had caused it swept across Africa like a, like a fire, wildfire. And when it reached the boarding school, you can imagine the staff was enraged and I was in great, great danger. I had been resigned to the coming humiliation. I knew that within seconds I would scream and I would throw down that candle until I heard that last phrase, the cruelest of all, parents' ministry ruined, Africans in hell because of this little boy. And that broke my heart more than any of the humiliation, more than any pain that may come my way ever could. I loved Africans. In my mind, I was African. After nine months of torture at that school, my spirit was restored by the loving kindness of this poverty-stricken village that we grew up in, in the Ivory Coast. They shaped my heart and my soul. I tell people everything I ever needed to know to lead Compassion's worldwide ministry, I learned from the poor in that little village. I used to pray every night as a little boy when I was home, Lord, please, if you love me, please let me wake up black tomorrow like all of my friends. And it would be the first thing I would check in the morning. I would throw off the sheet and look, still white. But maybe tomorrow, maybe tomorrow. As far as I was concerned, I was my father's right-hand man. He took me as a little boy. I remember reaching up, I was so small, to hold his hand as we went together into villages where no white man had been since the slave traders. And we opened up those villages to the gospel. I was the one with my slingshot who shot to scare away the the birds that were shrieking in the trees overseas so my father's voice preaching the gospel could be heard. As far as I was concerned, I was a missionary. And while I was gone for nine months, I was so concerned, how is dad doing this without me? 
So Africans in hell, because of me, suddenly from deep within me rose a strength that I cannot fully explain to this day. As the flames lit closer to my skin, I had a desperate thought. I could win. I could win this time. All through my childhood, I had lost to these people. But this time, he had unwittingly leveled the playing field. He had put himself in a position that I could actually win if I was willing to endure enough pain. I knew in my heart that he was wrong. He was lying. I could feel the evil. I could feel the injustice to the core of my being. I was not Satan's tool. I was just a little boy with a broken heart who had finally found his voice and cried out for rescue. So enough. Enough shame, enough abuse, enough lies. I thought as I stood there, it has to stop sometime. It has to stop somewhere. And I made my decision. It stops now. I'm not going to let go. I'm going to seize this moment and I'm going to make it stop. Nothing, I mean nothing, is going to make me cry out and give him that joy. I am not going to drop this candle. Here is where I take my stand. This is his Waterloo, but this is my Masada. I will not retreat any further. I shook violently in my fear. My tears were brimming in anticipation of the pain that I knew I was going to feel on my burned flesh. He turned his back to me and he, and he addressed the children. This tirade was growing in intensity. How evil I was, how hot hell was. But I could no longer hear his words. All I could hear was the blood pounding in my ears. I clenched my teeth, I tightened every muscle in my body, and I, I waited for the pain. My rage absolutely consumed me. I stared at the edges of my fingers as they turned red. I watched a blister pop out on one side of my finger and then on the other side of the finger. I looked over the top of the flame and I could see my best friend's face and he was looking, his, his eyes were saying, Wes, drop it, drop it, drop it, Wes. But I would not and suddenly, mysteriously, I was transported right out of my body and I was floating up somewhere over here looking back down on this skinny little boy and this candle in his hands and I could no longer feel any pain. I watched, however, as a witness, as, as a wisp of smoke rose up on either side of my finger. I'm not letting go. I'm not letting go. I'm not letting go. When just then one of the children couldn't stand it, he jumped up and he slapped it out of my hand. The children screamed and they scattered in all directions and the meeting was done. And there I stood all alone on my folding chair. I had received my calling. In that instant, I had gone from victim to victor. I knew that from that day forward, I would protect children. I knew from that day forward, I would forever speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. After I left that school, I entered a span of more than three decades with a different code of silence, and it was self-imposed. I never spoke of that pain, that part of my story. The school was shuttered up eventually, and after many, many years, these abusers were in fact held accountable. They weren't jailed as they should have been. It was the statute of limitations had run out, and it had happened on foreign soil. But after an official inquiry, the mission censored them. Here was their punishment. You are not allowed to work with children. Ouch. Those school's children limped away from their childhoods, many of them with lifelong scars that did not heal. For me, my passion against injustice, my crusade against abuse, my fight against poverty drove me eventually to Compassion International. If it hadn't existed 36 years ago when I came along, I would have had to be the one to start it. Can you imagine my joy that today, 400 children are going to give their lives to Jesus Christ across the ministry of compassion. It happened yesterday. It will happen again tomorrow. 142,000 children gave their lives to Christ at the knee of their pastor, including 50,000 little African children. (laughs) 
God can redeem anything. I was in Uganda just four days ago. I'm so jet lagged, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> I am much smarter than I'm coming across. For all these years, for decades, I have fought for children. Little ones who have no voice, little ones who have no choice. The passion that gripped me at age 10 still rages in me today. Poverty and abuse, I know this, speak the same language in the heart of a child. They say, give up. Nobody cares about you. There's nothing special about you. Nobody is coming to your rescue. Nothing will ever change. You'll always lose. Give up. And in the cement of a child's soul, that can become your worldview. Across the world now with compassion, I see these fingerprints of Satan. He's still using the same weapons against these little children that he used on me. In the world over, I see these empty, hollow eyes. The flame of the Spirit having been made in the image of God, the twinkle in the eye, gone. And nothing left but smoldering embers. And what I have done for 36 years is I have joined that church, I have joined Compassion Sponsors. Together we fan those little embers until a flame comes back and a child is rescued to the glory of God. How has this affected me as a leader? I may never have as much passion or courage as I had at age 10. But today, I'm a joyful, passionate, excited leader. I'm honored to get to shepherd one of the most dynamic, strategic ministries on earth. After 36 years with compassion, people keep expecting me maybe to slow down, to grow weary, but I haven't and I won't because of my story, because of my minute, a story that Satan intended for evil, but God redeemed and leveraged for good. I am never more than 10 seconds away from tears. But my tears aren't always tears of sorrow. Sometimes they are tears of great joy at what I get to do, at the victory I see in the lives of children, when poverty and evil are defeated. Joy by that God's grace, that I am still useful somehow in his kingdom, and that I get to lead a ministry to a million and a half children that addresses the very cry of my heart. And my question for you this morning is, what's your cause? What have you got in your life that can move you to tears? I'll cut you some slack in 30 seconds. Either tears of sorrow at the, at the need that needs to be addressed or tears of joy at the victories. Guys, if you do not have a cause in your life that can move you that deeply, you are not fully alive. There has to be something outside of you, bigger than you, that requires your time, your talent, your treasure, that is worthy of your passion and your drive. If you don't have that yet, look for it. Please do not live life stuck in second gear. Nothing is wasted. Everything can be redeemed and leveraged. I've noticed over the years that those people whose leadership has been launched by this kind of pain and sorrow, hardship and abuse, one of two things usually happens to them. One is they remain damaged. They don't expect good things to happen to them. They accept mediocrity. They may lead, but nothing much happens and they wonder why. Life is passing them by. They're stuck. They're locked in a prison of their own making. On the other hand, I run into people who are equally tragically in a prison. These are the ones who have taken that painful moment and have become driven to prove those abusers wrong. These people never miss an opportunity to advance, to climb. They got to joust every windmill, win every award to prove their worthiness. They're also striving to achieve, achieve, achieve. They are proving their abuser wrong with every minute and that's all that motivates them. They may rise high, but it's not with genuine joy in their accomplishments. There's no authentic satisfaction. There's no deep assurance in their soul that they really do have worth, even without all that striving. They are worthy because who gives them worth? Their Lord. Whichever path you have chosen, as a close, I want to tell you there's another path available to you, and that is the path of forgiveness. It's the path that I chose. I didn't discover this until I was 17 years old at a, at a fireside meeting. When a, when a speaker spoke, I was a wounded soul. I came to America when I was 15. Half of the children in my village had died of what I later learned was poverty. They didn't need to die. This man said, some of you have been really, really hurt and you are carrying around in your hearts and souls people who have hurt you. 
There's a good chance they don't even remember hurting you. There's a good chance they're not even sorry about hurting you. You are the only person paying the price for that pain. You are letting them live in your heart rent-free, and there is only one way out of this dilemma, and that's called forgiveness. And I remember sitting at the edge of the fire thinking, he's talking about me. I know what he's talking about. And so I said at age 17, okay, you people, I know that you're not sorry. I know you will never ask forgiveness, so I choose to forgive you. Now, get out. You get out of my mind. You get out of my heart. You get out of my life. You stole my childhood. You cannot have the rest of my life. You took my past. You cannot have my future. I forgive you. Now, get out. It was the best I could do. I've learned a lot about forgiveness since then. I have learned that forgiveness is one of the hardest things there is to do, and sometimes it's more painful than the thing that is being forgiven. I've learned that forgiving doesn't mean that what they did to you doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that they don't have to pay consequences for their actions. It doesn't mean that you have to reconcile and bring these dangerous people back in your life and maybe hurt you again. But I do know this. It means you have to give up your right to revenge. You've got to drop your candle, unclench your fist. We say, oh, forgive and forget. It doesn't happen that easily. But I can promise you this, you will never forget what you will not forgive. Well, that's my story. That's my minute. I am stunned that God would use it to his glory in any way. Most of the friends in my school that I grew up with fell down as children and never stood back up. I look forward to Revelation 21.4, the promise that one day soon, when we least expect it, we're going to hear a trumpet blast. We're going to look up and we're going to see the sky roll back like a scroll, and we're going to go home where we belong. And we, I'm, 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 please know there's no abuse there. There is no hunger there. There is no death there. There's no sorrow. In fact, there are no tears there. God says, I myself will wipe the last tears from their eyes. God himself who knit you in your mama's womb, those hands are going to dry the tears. The God who carried you when you went through your candle, those hands will wipe the last tears. The, the hands that took the nail on the cross to redeem you, those hands will take the last tears from your eyes. And I cannot wait. I cannot wait to run into the arms of my Lord, my Savior, my Redeemer, panting. And I can't wait for him to wipe the tears from my eyes, but I hope as he wipes the tears from my eyes, he sees how exhausted I am and how I have spent my life, and that he will also have to wipe the sweat from my brow. Because I lived the life he called me to live. I forgave, I loved, in spite of it all. Until I was suddenly and wonderfully interrupted by heaven. May God bless you. May God comfort you. May God heal you. May God use you mightily in his kingdom. He can redeem anything. Amen.